So warm welcome everyone to today's session. Um, this is a SEI, SEI webinar on the role of risk mitigation in renewable energy in Southern Africa. And my name is Carly Veyes and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to this webinar today. I work at Stockholm Environment Institute's Finance for Sustainable Development Program, and I will tell you more about that shortly. So today we will be discussing the role that risk mitigation has in renewable energy investments in Southern Africa. And we are also celebrating the launch of a new report called the Risk Mitigation and Transfer for Renewable Energy in Southern Africa. And uh, you can shortly find the link to the report in the chat. My colleague will share it there. Um, and so not only is the risk, uh, so not only is the, the issue of risk mitigation an important topic, but it is also an area gaining interest from various sectors and actors. And I believe that is made very clear by the almost 200 people that have registered for today's event. We'll see how many join us today live. Um, to help us, to help guide us through today's topics, we have my colleagues, Daniel and Mikkel, who are the researchers behind the report, and they will shortly present the study and share their findings. If you go back one slide, Daniel, um, just to the agenda, you've already seen it, but yeah, just to get an overview, we'll um, first have the presentation by Daniel and Mikkel, and then we'll have a panel discussion where we'll, we'll be joined by Dan and Judith and Vikus. And then lastly, we'll have a proper Q&A session. And I really encourage you to ask questions in the chat, and then we'll pick up as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. And now, um, jumping along, yeah, you've already seen this quickly. Oh, you can go back to the panel slide. Thanks, Daniel. So just uh, briefly to introduce who's here with us today to speak, we have uh, Dan Croft from IFC, one of the leading figures behind the World Bank Group program, Scaling Solar. We will also hear from Judith Raphael, who leads the work of Get Fit in Zambia. And last, by, last but not least, we also will hear from Vikas Kruger, who is one of the most prominent researchers on renewable energy in Africa. Um, before we jump into today's topic, I would like to briefly just explain who we are. And by we, I mean today's organizers. So next slide, please. Thank you. So Stockholm Environment Institute, known as SEI, um, it's an international nonprofit research and policy organization. And SEI tackles environment and development challenges. And we do so by scientific research, public policy advice, and capacity building. We have nearly 400 people working with us in 10 offices around the world. And uh, thank you. <laughs> On this slide, you can just get a little taste for all the various topics within environment and development that we work on. And you can of course uh, visit our website for more information. And as I mentioned previously, I work with Finance for Sustainable Development Program. And um, the goal of the program is to accelerate finance flows to sustainable economic activities in developing countries. And our focus is on practice-oriented research. And our belief is that finance flows to viable projects. So more focus is needed on drivers of viability. Yeah, with that, I would like to hand over to Daniel and Mikkel, my colleagues in the program. And we would love to hear more about your your the work you've been doing and your findings. And maybe just to kind of round off my part, I would just encourage those of you who have questions on a, in a clarifying sense, like if there's something you want clarified, you can write that in the chat during the, the presentation as well, and we'll try to, to catch those. Well, thank you, everyone. Fun that you're all here. And over to you, Daniel and Mikkel. Thanks so much, Carly. Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. So nice to see uh, so many of you. Many of you helped us with, uh, with the report. So it's, it's great to see you again. Um, we, 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 we all know that there are high expectations uh, around private finance contributing to sustainable development, flowing into 
projects with uh, you know sustainability relevance in in developing countries and we all know we've all heard that risk is one of the most important uh, barriers uh, to that so these things are known um but what we wanted to do with this this project is to to get a more concrete view of how this issue of risk plays out for the people who actually try to get projects financed and built the developers the lenders the regulators the the people directly involved with projects and the reason we 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 want to uh, focus on the project level is you know we, with Mikel we were doing a back of the envelope calculation uh, under one of the IEA scenarios Africa would need you know with an average size uh, uh, of 50 megawatts uh, Africa would need to have uh, operational about one project each day so even though it's it's absolutely relevant to to to, to have a, a general view of, of, of how things work we thought it's really important to talk to the people on the ground so this is why this this is mostly a, a learning journey for us we 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 gathered you know we, we tried to get to people and to ask them uh, looking at completed projects what made what made it possible to get to, to financial close uh, what combination of risk instruments worked what's missing maybe something needs to change and hopefully we can we can translate that into some learnings that can uh, uh, feed the policy conversation and you know that that's fulfilling our role at SEI bridging uh, science and policy um, Right. So the first leg, the first phase of our project, as we like to say, it, it focused on on uh, Southern Africa, the the SADC region minus South Africa for obvious reasons of scale. Um, what we did uh, is to take all projects that we could find, uh, you know, based on on public information that are larger than ten megawatts. It turned out that all of them were were PV. Uh, we selected four out of uh, of these twenty one. Um, we tried to, to dive deep into the, 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 their financing structure to contact the people who've actually worked on them and, and got them uh, uh, running. Uh, and we really thank them, all the 35, more than 35 people we, we've managed to interview um, uh, since the start of this program. Um, and we've also convened a workshop in Zambia and Lusaka in uh, October of last year, where we gathered some of them uh, in a, in a, you know, a, let's say closed door kind of meeting, an honest, frank exchange of ideas, where we really wanted to 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 understand how do you perceive the the issue of risk, uh, what do you do about it, what can be done better, and you know when 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 we when we talk about risk there are so many uh many ways to look at it uh to look at it and so many ways to define it and there are so many risks involved obviously but in a more practical sense for the developer trying to do a project in uh in zambia let's say the uh, risk basically means the the probability of of the value of investment of their investment declining uh, over the lifetime of, of the project, over the long lifetime of the project. And since uh, uh, we, we, we all know uh, in, uh, in, the, in Southern Africa and in large parts of, of the continent, um, the, the dominating structure is project finance, which means um, you know, the projects rely on, on non-recourse debt, uh, which also means uh, uh, that you need to get lenders to feel comfortable about being repaid uh, um, and uh, finding ways of of uh, of uh, getting lenders to 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 have that view of you know have that security of of, of being paid and when 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 a project is being developed with so many actors the, you know the construction O and M the uh, everyone involved there are many risks that need to be distributed among the parties uh, that can that can bear them and many of them are uh, uh distributed through private arrangements you know the the, the vast network of contracts that uh, that are negotiated and, and set up um, and this is not that different from from other geographies but what remains and what what makes the region a little bit i mean 
more than a little bit different and uh, 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 creates persistent risks is the country risk, meaning political, macroeconomic, currency, uh, and the, the off the risk. Um, most of these projects rely on a utility that in most countries is uh, weak from a, a financial point of view. This is why we have this multitude of, of, of DFI-led uh, uh, risk mitigation instruments, programs, and instruments that you see here on the right. And I'm absolutely sure we did not cover all of them. So even, even looking at the, this uh, limited number of projects and the ones, uh, the, the programs and, and instruments that were active or offered in these uh, uh, projects, we, we see already that there's a multitude of them, which you know, we will be, we'll, we'll discuss later, also means something. And by, by looking at, uh, at, at these uh, projects, successful projects, and the risk mitigation instruments that were used, we see a number of stories emerging. Um, the first story is that, you know, in some of the countries, the complexity of the risk architecture is absolutely obvious like um you 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 can see that uh, the approach was whatever it takes to to get the first project on the ground in some of the uh, the countries that belong to this uh, uh category of, of of least developed countries you see um up there in in in, in malawi we have the salima project uh, only you know the the, the number of of, uh, of DFIs involved um, and the risk instruments used is illustrative. We have uh, MIGA offering a sizable uh, guarantee with IDA support from this private sector window. You see the liquidity facility of ATI intervening and uh, backstopping the 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 power purchase agreement. You see the the, the viability gap uh, um, viability gap uh, grant from from the PIDG uh, and FMO uh, equity investment into the developer. So uh, on top of the, the policy risk mitigation that that uh, Millennium Corporation uh, Challenge Corporation did, um, looking at uh, at Mozambique at Mokuba, um, we see a similar picture with with the embassy of Norway uh, providing a grant for the transmission line that was uh, then contributed in kind by, by, the, by the utility. Um, you see IFC concessional lending, uh, guarantee from North Fund, and again, the viability gap uh, uh, funding from, from the PIDG. So you, you can see this story emerging. It was about getting the first project in countries that did not have any experience with, with renewables and achieving that demonstration effect. And I think you could say this, this has worked. Um, for example, in Mozambique, we now see the, the ProLair uh, program of the European Union doing competitive selection, or they have already had, uh, uh, they already have a, a project selected. So it could, it could be said that the demonstration effect has been achieved, but at the same time, probably this is not the structure that you want to replicate uh, around the continent, given the complexity and the time needed for uh, uh, for uh, uh, closing such such complex uh, projects. Uh, in contrast to that, we have uh, we have the case of Namibia. You know, the case of uh, one of the few countries that, at least at the time, uh, benefited from an investment grade uh, credit rating. You know, and even if we, we we just look at the picture, it's so much cleaner. It was so much easy easier to to draw. Um, you see a, a private lender uh, lending in local currency um, with a guarantee from Proparco that uh, was able to extend the tenor from eight to fifteen years. So. Uh, making the debt terms um, uh, better. But you see an European IPP uh, investing equity alongside uh, uh, local investors and selling uh, through a PPA to, to NAM Power at the time, uh, uh, you know, and even now, uh, one of the, 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 the utilities that are doing, you know, well uh, uh, in, in the region. So 
you know, the, the story that's emerging from here, probably not uh, earth shattering, is that yes, countries that are that that have a, a better macroeconomic conditions and where the utilities managed uh, better need a lot less risk mitigation. Um, so uh, the sound management of the utility, let's say, is the best way to crowd in private fi uh, finance into renewables. And then we have the, let's say, somewhere in the middle, we have Zambia. Zambia was the country we chose for our uh, deep dive. And we, we, we chose it for a number of reason, reasons. Um, Zambia was a testing ground for many of the of, of the programs and the instruments that we we are discussing um, the risk uh, risk mitigation instruments. Uh, as you know, uh, it's been the, the first country that implemented the scaling solar program uh, of the World Bank Group, and uh, Dan Cross will speak about it uh, uh, later. Um, it's uh, Zambia also implemented the Get Fit. Uh, uh, program with Judy, well, uh, Judy Raphael will, will discuss. Uh, it's also the country where the, uh, the first PPA was awarded by Africa Green Co, which is a model that's being exper it's like an experimental model um, that's uh, trying to create uh, an alternative to the utility PPA, uh, uh, creating a, a credit worthy off taker that then trades power into the, into the power pool. And we'll see how that works. Um, but from, from our experience in Zambia, the, the one subject that dominated was the, the issue of debt. The, the sovereign default, the IMF package, it was, uh, as I said, dominating the conversation. Maybe, you know, uh, maybe we have news about that from, from we, we've recently heard uh, in Paris, there's been some agreement on, on debt restructuring and maybe things are improving. But uh, this was the uh, one of our conclusions. In a country that's trying so many things, uh, the, the issue of debt is probably going to lead to significant delays in, in climate critical infrastructure. So these have been the, the let's say the three emerging stories uh, uh, from our uh, project so far in Southern Africa. And uh, I leave it now to Mikel to, to uh, take us through the, findings and, and recommendations. Thank you, Daniel. Um, maybe before I go into the findings, also mention in the context of our program, we did this in, in Southern Africa last year. We're now replicating this research in West Africa, in ECOWAS region. So we look forward to also have a workshop this fall in Accra. And so if any of you is working or interested in in West Africa, renewable energy finance, please do contact us because we're replicating this work. So some of the findings, uh, and these are like the, the big picture findings, and I, we do encourage you to go into our report and you have the link in the chat. So please, uh, please go there if you want to uh, go in detail on what we mean. There's many pages of this. Um, but basically, one of the main findings is uh, uh, risk mitigation and transfer instruments, RMTs for short, they are necessary, but not sufficient. So by necessary, what do we mean is all the projects we looked at, maybe with exception of the one in Namibia, would not have reached financial close without them, even the one in Namibia. So it was a necessary ingredient for them to happen, but it is not sufficient. They are not enough, for instance, for new projects to, to deal to reach financial close uh, in under current situation, as we will hear, for instance, uh, from the GetFit case. Um, so then they are definitely not enough to, to overcome the current uh, debt issues. We also found that, uh, that RMTs have been very effective up to date. We don't know what the future, but up to now, they have been very effective in the operational phase. So those projects who got on the ground and got uh, operational with RMTs, uh, their investment value has been protected so far uh, through the use of RMTs. We, we believe mostly through a hollow effect from what we have heard. Um, But again, they have limits to what they can achieve. So RMTs are good at pushing good projects over the line. They definitely do not put, push bad projects, which I think is a good thing uh, because we don't want the bad projects to come through. So we, there are, in some cases, there may be negative effects on the public finances of the countries due to currency issues and to the issue of guarantees and liabilities. But overall, once we take the pros and the cons, 
we reached the conclusion that so far RMTs, the way they're designed, they do not lead to moral hazard, um, even though they, they may uh, be perceived as not as creating incentives to or <laughs> disincentives to reform uh, for utilities. They also are, uh, in all cases, we saw uh, accompanied by by all these side measures to improve governance and, and capacity building, which basically offset those potential uh, side negative effects. So we, we reach a conclusion that they do not lead uh, to moral hazard. We also offer uh, four high level recommendations. The first one is we need to make it work under that distress. So we have an urgent situation, both for climate change, but also for the needs of development and energy in the, in the region. So we do need those projects to come online urgently. We also have a, a reality on the ground that is we have that distress and we have many countries where uh, the public finances are, are suffering and particularly uh, the issue of guarantees, renewable energy projects in the region will not happen without public guarantees. So we do need to make it work. We, need, we do need the guarantees to somehow happen under a debt distress situation. Now, how that happens, it's a, we don't know, but one specific proposition we do is when there is a debt uh, restructuring package, do make an explicit clause about what's gonna happen to guarantees for climate critical infrastructure. And what the clause is, is not as important as the fact that it's there and explicit, because otherwise what happens is this in introduces so much uncertainty into the financing of the projects that just spelling this out takes a couple of years and this all this time is lost. So recommendation number one, uh, actionable recommendation, include explicit clauses addressing climate critical infrastructure guarantees in the debt restructuring packages. The second big issue, as everyone <laughs> who follows the issues knows, is currency, right? Currency exchange, renewable energy projects in particular, they are very capital intensive. Um, they are hard currency. Uh, the equipment is bought in hard currency. So we do have a currency issue, the revenues in a long stream revenue in local currency. So the currency risk is critical. Um, there are as many as we saw from the meeting in Paris and other initiatives, the Bridgeton initiatives and others. There's, it's, this is something that is in the radar uh, in the international agenda, how to deal with currency. We come with the proposal that let's create a currency safeguard. So the same way that DFIs have uh, social safeguards and environmental safeguards, let's create a currency safeguard. Let's create a, a safeguard that ensures that if lending in hard currency is detrimental to the development mandate of DFIs, then let's do something about it. So what we ask is for DFIs to create a protocol and this protocol should be particular to each DFI according to their own uh, way of operating, but let's create a protocol to, uh, for a currency safeguard that establishes at what threshold lending in hard currency is not acceptable. And when that happens, then please do not stop lending. We do need the lending, but let's make sure that the currency burden is shared. Uh, so either through subsidized by the DFIs or shared in some other mechanism. And we make some proposals on that on the paper. Again, we invite you to read it. Another um, recommendation we make is regarding the transaction costs. So we, you saw that table that Daniel presented, there was about the 10 or a dozen uh, instruments, but the reality is in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's over a, there's nearly a hundred instruments uh, identified for instance, by an excellent report by RIS for Africa. So there's nearly a hundred instruments um, for somehow financing and mitigating risk uh, in the region. But, and, and we won, by the way, we won many instruments. Some will fail, some will succeed, but we do need uh, as all of the above approach because we do need to accelerate uh, deployment in the region. But, but the fact is these instruments, they're all different. They're not standardized. And what we hear over and over and over again from the developers on the ground is, we don't know what's out there. We cannot compare them. Uh, if we want to engage with an instrument, we, if we want to know what the instrument is about, we need to deeply engage with them. So, so we, so there's a huge transaction cost. Basically, in order to know what's what's around, we need to engage with the instrument, and that takes time, that takes energy, that costs money. So there is a cost. We need to help navigate that. We need tools tailored for developers um, to to help navigate this this variety. And the last one, and I know I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll go it quick, but, and, and this one is not new, but it just has to be repeated over and over. DFIs are development, emphasis on development finance institutions. So we need to leverage the D. We need to leverage development part. We need them to land where others cannot land. We hear 
uh, and in some cases that's happening, but we hear from stakeholders on the ground um, that in many cases, uh, DFIs are perceived uh, to operate uh, in a very risk averse manner, even more risk averse than commercial entities, uh, and that they did not fulfill the development mandate. So even though it's not new, we just have to say it again, please do leverage the in DFI. And uh, thank you with this, uh, we look forward to the discussion, but I'll pass back to Carly. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, well, I um, I did see that there was a question in the chat, uh, but it's about the PowerPoint, if we can share this afterwards. Yes, thumbs up. So I suggest that those who want the, um, the PowerPoint send me an email and I'll write my email address in the chat shortly and then I can send it out. But now I would like to invite Dan to take the floor. Dan Croft from IFC, um, would, could you tell us a bit more about scaling solar and um, yeah, if you have any reflections on what you've heard also. Sure, thanks Carly. Um, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. And it's nice to see some familiar names in the participants and, and to meet some of you uh, for the first time as well. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, I think on the flyer, I was billed as IFC scaling solar. Uh, that's just a procurement program, and I'll say a little bit more about it. Um, formerly, I'm the regional upstream manager uh, for infrastructure in Africa, based in Accra. Um, and what we mean by upstream, for those who don't know, this is nothing to do with oil and gas exploration. Uh, this is all to do with sector, project, market development, uh, typically over a three to five year investment horizon. Um, but often uh, and regularly, <laughs> it ends up being rather longer. Uh, so this is the sort of long, slow burn stuff. Um, and the long term aim there is really to put the D back in DFI to create markets, to try and build a pipeline of investable projects for not just for ourselves, but for um, other DFIs, for commercial lenders, for sponsors, uh, and ultimately for our client governments who are, at the end of the day, our shareholders. So I'm going to try not to say too much. And despite the slide, thank you very much, Carly. Uh, I don't have any. Um, I'm not a fan um, because I tend to just speak for longer and I'm more interested in hearing from others on the chat um, and getting a good discussion going. So I'm going to just try and limit this. I think Scaling Solar has been around for a while and there's a lot of material out there. Uh, not all of it um, entirely accurate, uh, but we can get to some of those questions a bit later on. But um, it essentially, it's a World Bank group program, and that's very important. I'm here representing IFC, and we were instrumental in the design, but this was designed across the World Bank group, recognizing that everybody brought different um, value propositions. And it was we, we developed it to make it faster and easier and more competitive for developing countries to procure utility scale, private sector, solar power projects. That's it. Um, it was really designed around three premises, and it's worth just tipping our hats to uh, the South African uh, IFP or REIPP program, um, because these three things, were we saw them there. We realized that that program probably wouldn't work in many other countries in Africa for various reasons, which I'm happy to go into, um, but that you could take the bare bones and design something that would work for other countries. And those three basic elements are transparent competitive tendering, which I'll be saying quite a bit more about, pre-negotiated and demonstrably bankable template project and procurement documents, which need to be fair and balanced to all parties, and then a package of World Bank Group support to the governments and to the private sector, uh, which are available from project inception all the way through to financial close and onto operations. And some of those were listed in the introductory presentation, the, the RMT instruments. Um, but my working hypothesis is that risk mitigation goes way beyond instruments. And I'll be saying a little bit more about what I mean by that. When we started, we saw low solar prices or increasingly low solar prices everywhere except sub-Saharan Africa. And so as a, as, as a DFI, we, we sort of asked ourselves why that was when there was so much solar resource uh, and it must have been a higher perception of risk. Um, I'm sure that for the more inland projects, there are also higher costs. Logistics kicks into this and uh, availability of equipment and warranties and all of those things. 
But ultimately, it's all about a higher risk perception. But what we saw when we first started talking to the government of Zambia, who were our first client, was that uh, the prevailing offers from uh, developers, unsolicited proposals, uh, looking for negotiated deals, were around 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and that was typically without any resource mapping and no costing of fundamental equipment either, or no detailed costing. So that was a thumbs up, which logically, had it been accepted, must have been designed to allow considerable contingency and fat to enable the developers to get to financial close before they actually breach their own return requirements. Less than a year through the program we designed, we halved that to six cents. Uh, it was actually about nine months. And there are some RMT things there and we can dig into those, there are some instruments, but ultimately the key determinant of that was transparent procurement, transparent competitive selection. Subsequently, we've seen um, similar kind of pioneering results in Senegal and pleasingly now outside of Africa. It was designed for Africa, but we're now seeing that in Uzbekistan as well, where the government is embarking on a second round. Um, and we think that this formula of transparent competitive procurement, whether that's done through scaling solar or not, and I mentioned REIPP, there are other programs. We're going to be hearing from Judith on GetFit as well. Has to be the best way for governments to scale renewables and achieve value for money. Now, in terms of what's included, it covers everything from transaction advice, project preparation, uh, standardized documentation, which can be rolled out quickly. And we have to remember that this was done at a time of falling solar equipment prices, rapidly falling solar equipment prices. So if you negotiated your price and took two years to negotiate your documents, the chances are that the government would realize that your price was wrong. And then they would reopen your price and you could no longer deliver for that price because that had all sorts of other knock-on effects. So the key here was speed. The critical path item was the process, not the construction. You can build these things in five or six months, but the critical path item was the speed of the procurement process. So that's really what we focused on. Uh, a, a lot of the criticism that we had subsequently was that the whole thing actually wasn't that quick. No, but a lot of the, the delay came after the procurement had happened. And what you realize is that the same things that hold up projects in Africa were still holding up projects. Government ministries not talking to each other, unclear title to land. I can go on and on, but most of you know all of this. So if we think at its heart that a, that a solar tariff comprises, it really has driven by three factors. And we think in terms of cents per kilowatt hour, and two of them pertain to the cents, right? So you've got the cost of the kit, which is give or take the same for everybody, though bigger players can usually command uh, better prices. And the cost of capital, which of course is not the same for everybody. So how do you get down capital cost? You attract uh, larger players with cheaper capital and you de-risk the project for them so that by the time they bid, they are really just sharpening their pencils, okay? This is a clear economic principle that competition drives down prices. Of course, the other half of the, uh, of the equation, the, the denominator is the kilowatt hours. That's really a function of plant efficiency and solar resource. And that's the same for everybody, give or take a few variations in terms of O&M. So cost of capital is the key driver. The key risk mitigant is low prices. Um, One of the things that's also worth bringing out in terms of another risk mitigant that isn't really covered on that chart that we saw earlier is the cradle to grave nature of the process. So if you think about what we did, we designed a tender process, which was designed to focus on the best, the most credible developers with the cheapest costs of capital. And the reason for that is if you are running a program in South Africa and it's round four of a renewable energy program and you're looking for another 3000 megawatts and 50 megawatts doesn't turn up, that's okay, that's their loss, because you've still got the rest of it. If you are a minister in Zambia, dipping your toes in the renewable energy ocean, amidst quite a bit of skepticism in the country that we sh really shouldn't be moving away from hydro, should we, because that's what we've been relying on. If that 50 megawatt project doesn't turn up, it's quite embarrassing, possibly career limiting, career ending even. So it's very important that when we go in and talk to our shareholders, the government, about helping them procure utility scale solar, we have to be as confident as possible that the project is going to materialize. This is also something that's 
very clearly forgotten. And so what we did by focusing on the best developers actually allowed the financing offers to be more aggressive. We could take more risk because the likelihood of those developers failing to build their plants went down. Okay, so that is also risk mitigation, nothing to do with instruments, nothing to do with guarantees or anything like that. That is just about focusing on people that know what they're doing, because ultimately our development mandate is the delivery of low cost infrastructure. Uh, that's really what we're trying to do. It also means that the projects are most likely to close. So some of the numbers that I'd just like to bring out just to demonstrate the point about transparent competition. In that first bid in Zambia, one of the two projects, not the one that was on the slide, and Gonye was the project that NL won, Bangweulu was the one that uh, Neo N won. And we had six bids. The lowest was 6.015 cents. The highest was 10.6 cents for the same risk profile. Now, I probably don't need to spell it out, but I will. That is clear evidence that all things being equal, cost of capital, bid or risk appetite, how hungry they are for the deal, drives the prices down. And what happens when you've got a government that has chosen what it wants to procure, it's gone out and actually de-risked it in advance, it's then offered that project to the market, and it's asked bidders to sharpen their pencils and to come back with minimal negotiation. It means that everybody is crawling over everybody else to get it, which means they all sharpen their, their pencils and lower their prices as much as they can. To put that into context, some of the analysis we did for some of the other governments that wanted to see this, we're going to ignore the six cent because that was a bit of an outlier. Those guys really, really wanted to win, and that's great. Zambia got a great result. But if we look at the other five bids, there were three at the eight to 8.4 cent per kilowatt hour range, and there were two at the 10.4 to 10.6 cents per kilowatt hour range. Now, if we focus on the difference between eight and 10, and if we also remember that these numbers mean nothing in a vacuum. It, you can, it, a lot depends, for example, on whether it's a fixed tariff or whether it's indexed over time. So let's compare 8 cents and 10 cents and fixed and indexed at 2%. Okay, so we've got four numbers. If we look at fixed, the difference between 8 cents and 10 cents on a notional 100 megawatt plant with the same solar conditions as there were in Zambia, the difference is 60 million to 160 million over 25 years. So that's 100 million more from two cents per kilowatt hour on the uh, tariff. If we look at it indexed, it's even worse. It's not 60 million then. Over 25 years, the government will be paying 170 million for power. And at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, they would be paying 300 million. So the difference there is 130. Now, if we go back and we imagine that from the government's perspective, this is fundamentally a public procurement. They're buying a service. And I hear everything about dollars and forex, but until plants are actually, until equipment is made in country, these are going to be dollar denominated assets. They can pay the dollars up front or they can pay dollars over the life of the project. But fundamentally, that's just a reality that everybody needs to deal with. But if we look at the difference there, that is why it's so important to get transparent price discovery through competition in order to drive down those prices because the impact on the fiscus over 25 years is absolutely huge. Let me wrap up. So some key messages. It's not just the RMT tools, they're important, but it's not just them. It's also a de-risk project and a competitive process. Bidders see two risks and these are often conflated. There's process risk, will my project close? And there's project risk, will it work? Will I be able to finance it? Will I be able to build it? Will the government pay me, et cetera? What we tried to do was to take out the, the process risk. We tried to make it as likely as possible that these projects would close so that bidders and good bidders at that could focus on the project risk. And ultimately, this comes down to public procurement. None of us, if we were looking to buy a car, would make sure our driveway was nice and clean and tidy, and then we'd sit on our front porch and wait for people to come and offer us their own cars because they'd offer us cars we didn't want, cars that might not work, they might not even own the car, etc. Most of us would work out what kind of car we wanted, we would go around car dealerships, we would test drive, we would research, and then we would negotiate the price. Okay, and that is really all that Scaling Solar, and I hesitate to say get fit as well, try and do, allowing governments to procure what they want to buy, 
rather than what developers want to sell. The advantage of that is that if the government knows that on the day, through a transparent process, they've got the best for that project on that day with that equipment, with that solar resource, in that EPC market and that financing market with those tax incentives, these are all the variables, they get the best price they possibly could have. Any investor is going to look at that and think it's less likely that that government is going to marry in haste and repent at leisure. They are going to think that this is the best deal they could have done. It's a positive decision that they made to procure. They've procured. And that was the price they got because the process was robust. That means it's more likely they're going to pay. That means those RMT instruments are more likely to be available. We don't offer those as sticking plasters. We offer them in the expectation that they buy us time to fix the problems in the sector. So it, it's all interrelated. And the single biggest mitigant at the end of the day is a retail tariff that is below the prevailing, sorry, a wholesale tariff that is below the prevailing retail tariff. If a utility is losing money on every unit of electricity it sells, it is more likely to run into trouble and the project is therefore riskier. If it is making money or breaking even, it is more likely to be able to pay going forwards. This is just simple economics. So. I would like to stop there. I do have some responses to some of your conclusions and recommendations, but I'm probably over time, so I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And you will get the chance to talk more during the discussion. But first, let's hear from Judith. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Yes. OK, great. So you can move to the next slide. Uh, unlike Dan, uh, I usually talk longer if I don't have slides, so I try to have a few slides just to guide my thoughts a little bit. <laughs> so basically, I'm here to present on uh, Getford Zambia. Uh, key question maybe is who or what is Getford Zambia? So Getford Zambia is really the implementing program for the government's refit strategy, and I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit more later. The program is being funded by KFW. Um, through the German government. Um, and it's a grant of approximately 41 million euros. The primary purpose of the program is really to promote uh, investment in renewable energy by private sector entities. So that was the key driver. The grant provided by KFW, uh, and I'll also speak about that uh, uh, in a bit more uh, on the next slide, but but the key element of the, of the grant is not to provide financing to the, to the projects. I think I often get the question, why isn't KFW just financing the projects? So KFW is um, an entity that only extends financing to public entities such as the government of Zambia or Zesco. It doesn't lend to private sector entities. So probably a key point. So what then is the 41 million for? It's essentially for grants, uh, element that we call viability gap funding, and also what we refer to as uh, the grid facility. These two elements arguably provide some de-risking to the projects, but um, also meant to help with uh, affordability. So a bit more about the program on the next slide and uh, what we ultimately intend to do. So essentially what I would say is the program was designed or is aimed at uh, being a catalyst um, for future or rather to encourage future private sector investment. So KFW is hoping that by implementing uh, the program and uh, what you see on the slide is what we call our toolbox. Um, by implementing this, we are hoping to improve framework conditions for private sector investment in Zambia to such an extent that get fit would not be required in order for government to move forward. So the idea is implement the program in a manner where you can hand over the documents, the framework to the government to continue with implementation. So what is the toolbox? So for those that know Zambia, they are, and I think especially over the last uh, two years, there's been a lot of interest by private sector entities to invest in the country. A uh, lot of entities have got what they term here in ZESCO, feasibility study rights. 
But I think what a lot of the developers uh, and IPPs are struggling with is a, is a clear path to market. And I think Dan has actually articulated it well. It adds to the cost or the tariff that ultimately the utility pays because there's no certainty. So developers are spending money on development um, work, but they just never sure if they will ever be able to secure uh, a PPA with the entity. So similar to scaling solar, what we, what we aimed at achieving is to provide a competitive uh, procurement platform. Um, aim on our end really is to work together with the Ministry of Energy, similar to scaling solar, coming up with a set of uh, procurement documents. So um, RFP documents together with standardized um, what we call project uh, agreements, which includes PPA, IA, uh, and a grid connection, bankable. And we use that in order to tender out um, projects to private sector. The other element that we have is what we call a debt and risk mitigation facility. Here we've primarily partnered with uh, ATI and the facility we made available under the tender uh, is the RLSF. I've mentioned before that we've got viability gap funding and grid facility. These two products are mainly aimed at the small hydro program. I think Dan Croft has, has highlighted that um, given the nature of uh, um, solar PV, right? Prices have been, uh, low pricing has been achieved across the world and question was why not in Zambia? Uh, we set out to prove, uh, we weren't sure if we'd be able to do that, that Zambia itself is also capable of getting a low price outcome on, um, on solar. And thus, we, we didn't need the viability gap funding or the grid facility in order to make those projects viable. And then the last element of our toolbox, what we call technical assistance. Under the technical assistance framework, we hope to work with government, I think, to uh, essentially close some of the gaps also highlighted by IFC, i.e. Um, making sure that certain licensing frameworks are addressed. Um, ensuring that there's no duplication in work being done by different entities with, with, uh, within Zambia. And I'll just give uh, an example of that. One of the things that we found is that there are different entities that are essentially responsible for issuing of rights. One is called uh, feasibility study rights, and that's issued by an entity called OPPI under the Ministry of Energy. But then you'd have the Water Authority in Zambia, WAMA, also issuing rights for entities to access um, uh, water in order to do their studies. Uh, key here is to try and see whether or not one can design a framework that eliminates uh, some of the duplication in, in work and licensing requirements and permitting, and in doing so, reduce uh, the cost of the projects. Uh, so other element under the technical assistance is really uh, capacity building um, as well. Uh, next slide. The next slide is just meant to demonstrate, I think as soon as it changes, it's meant to demonstrate uh, our key tenders. So under the refit strategy, we had a 100 me megawatt allocation under solar PV and 100 under um, what we call, uh, or rather under... Um, small hydro uh, power program. How we decided to, to, to run or how we are running the two processes are very different. Um, our approach has also been very different. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you guys can see the next slide. I'm still on the <laughs> get for toolbox. Okay, there we go. So this is essentially the two programs or the two um, technologies for which um, we've been, um, that we've been allocated. The, the, the refit strategy. So solar PV tender, that one we started the auction process. And as I mentioned, it's a reverse auction process. We started that in 2018, um, started with shortlisting, um, also similar to sc scaling solar, trying to get the best entities shortlisted. So had very, very stringent and very competitive criteria. Um, Key thing, and, and, and maybe primarily part of what's the difference between scaling solar and get fit. And again, it's not that the one is right and the other one is wrong. It's just two approaches to achieve different outcomes. Personally, I think 
both can work in a market. Governments probably just need to decide which is more appropriate for for which te technology, et cetera, et cetera. But, but both certainly, um, in my view, could, could work. Our approach was re really to allow the developers to take all of the upfront risk. That site selection, uh, doing feasibility studies on those sites, trying to secure the land, trying to ensure that they've got uh, appropriate connection to the grid. The only thing that we did under the tender was we provided a list of feasible um, transmission or distribution connection points, whether it was a line or whether it was a substation um, that developers could connect to. So they would know upfront whether or not their bids would be successful because for those that could not connect to the, to the grid, they would obviously be disqualified. So there we work quite closely with, uh, with Zesco. On the hydro, not going to say too much about it, but essentially under that tender, it's refit based. Um, we work together with ERB, which is the Energy Regulation Board in order to determine refits. Um, idea there really was to try and keep the refits as, I would almost say as low as possible to the extent uh, feasible uh, in the hope that uh, some of the developers could um, execute projects within that refit. And for those that are, are not able to do so, this is what we call viability gap funding. Grid facility really is to ensure that the projects can connect to the grid. So one of our key learnings in Uganda was the fact that many of the projects were able to complete construction. This is small hydro pro projects, but then didn't have any access to the grid. Uh, the government, I think at the time had indicated that they would be responsible for the grid. But uh, unfortunately, I think given their delays, projects went ahead, they implemented waiting for government to uh, complete the grid. And so grid risk was sitting with the government. Under the get fit part of the small hydro program, we're trying to avoid that. Uh, so trying to de-risk the, the program and cost for the government in that regard. Uh, maybe just to mention, both our projects have got um, a portion of indexation. So on the solar PV, 10% um, and under the hydro, 15% of the total price is indexed. So where are we with both programs? Uh, needless to say, as I said, started in 2018, I think we had really high hopes together with the developers. I think much enthusiasm uh, around the program. Um, we had also managed to complete uh, within record time, the, 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 the tender itself, I think probably seven months. Uh, and by April 2019, we're able to announce um, who the winning bidders were. They were all awarded development rights. Uh, those entities I've listed there, Red Rockets, Global Ec Solar, Innova, those, and then uh, Innova in partnership with a local uh, uh, Zambian entity called uh, CC. I think, unfortunately, as we, and I don't know how many of you have been following developments in, in, in Zambia, um, at the time we launched the tender, yes, there was an IMF program that uh, was being put in place. Um, there was also uh, sector Should reforms it? underway. Yeah. I just want to let you know uh, that you need to soon wrap up. Okay, so um, I think this is almost the last slide. There were also sector reforms underway. Um, and at that point, um, I think, unfortunately, th things didn't go uh, as planned. A cost of service study was underway, it unfortunately got delayed. Um, and once all of that happened, you know, we had uh, financiers basically uh, deciding to suspend uh, funding uh, in Zambia, also primarily driven by uh, the fact that um, uh, uh, government had defaulted on the debt. So essentially now where we are with the, with the, high, with the solar projects, we are still waiting for financial close. Uh, and then under the hydro program, I've said quite a bit on that. The only thing I'd mention there is hydro uh, RFP for now is on, on hold. Uh, I think the last slide just essentially speaks about, I think, some of the elements that uh, Dan has already raised, so I wouldn't go through that. But essentially what we are trying to achieve is to ensure that we've got affordable tariffs for the utility. 
we're hoping that that by having tariffs that are below average uh, selling price, so wholesale, wholesale tariff or PPA tariffs below selling price would help as an element of de-risking projects because it would ensure that the utility is able to, to, to sell that. Um, yeah, key things that we're now working on in to ensure uh, financial or rather to ensure that projects can move forward is really to try and see whether or not we can uh, work with lenders um, in order to look at other risk mitigations that will enable the projects to move forward. So uh, that's essentially concluding on, uh, on what's on the slide. Thank you, Judy. And uh, now we will jump into the panel discussion and I invite Vikus, who we haven't heard from yet, to join the digital stage. And I will also spotlight you so that everyone sees you. Thanks, Carly. And yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Daniel, Mikael, uh, Dan, and Judith. It was great to hear from you. And um, I think it's a great report that's been produced, not to pat ourselves on the back, but I think um, Daniel and, and Mikael in, in particular um, have been able to capture a lot of the, the real issues uh, related to risk mitigation in the sector. Um, just for you, those of you that don't know me, my name is Vikus Kruger. I work at, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. We have a small research unit here at the business school called called Power Futures Lab, um, primarily working uh, or producing research on power sector investment, but also um, power sector reform and regulation in Africa. Um, and, and just as a very quick um, background to why we're looking at this topic, I mean, with, within our unit, we've been tracking investment levels in power in, in Sub-Saharan Africa over the past um, 30 years. And, and I mean, they, this, probably three big things we've seen. The first is that there is a massive gap, right? There's, there is just a lot of new investment needed. Um, of the, the 115 gigawatts that's installed um, in the 56 countries in the region, half of that is just in South Africa. 90% um, of the remainder is, is shared among 15 countries. And then we have you know, 23 countries with systems smaller than 500 megawatts, seven with um, systems smaller than 100 megawatts. So uh, it, it leaves a big uh, gap in the sector um, and, and the need for scale is, is uh, incredible. The other thing that we've seen is that renewables are taking off um, and the investment levels have increased substantially. Um, but they're not uh, kind of near the levels that we need. And so there's still uh, much more work being done. And, and the, the risk mitigation instruments and uh, products that are being used are welcome and I think make a big difference as, as uh, Daniel pointed out. But there are still very serious questions around how, how one scales these. And so my first question, Dan, is uh, Dan Croft, for you um and yeah there's there's been a, a lot of um criticism thrown at the scanning solar program for various reasons and i i don't intend to go into all of them right now but one of them is that the program has promised more especially in terms of scale than it's been able to deliver in in especially in africa um, and, and I'd be curious if you can just unpack a little bit more what, what exactly it is, right? The ambition of the program was always to, to scale um, and to, um, you know, to unlock the benefits um, that you get from, from running such a kind of a, a large program with a, with a um, significant backing from, from the World Bank Group. But um, at this stage, um, there have been a lot of announcements, but not necessarily all that many results. And so maybe you can just help us understand what those results are and or what the reasons are and kind of where, where risk mitigation um, instruments sit within this story uh, and, and what the limits are to these. Sure. Um, so I think to put this into context, and again, another very sort of simple analogy, 
not about cars this time, but about um, manual tools. So if we think in terms of a hammer, and let's imagine you've never seen a hammer before, and I show you a hammer and say, okay, assuming you had big enough muscles and you never got tired, you could probably hammer in something like 3,000 nails in a day, a normal working day. You say, thank you very much. And then three years later, the hammer's still sitting on the desk where I left it. And you say, but you promised me 3,000 miles a day. I didn't. I told you that's what it could do. It's a tool, right? We have to remember that in the markets in which we operate, these are not liberalized markets. Uh, sorry, don't need to tell you this. You know this better than I do. But that the role of the government in this is central. Um, what we did was create something which any government could pick up, tweak. So that was a learning for us. It was not quite as standard as we thought it might be. And of course, that was probably pretty obvious, you know, um, but it, it, it always has to be tweaked for local public procurement law, for the intricacies of grid connections and who takes forex risk and the role of the utility and the credit worthiness of the utility, et cetera, et cetera. But it's something which could be picked up. But a government needs to want to do it. They need to want transparent competitive procurement. They need to want to make or be willing to make difficult decisions. So our contribution to that was we'll help you de-risk the project. We'll do a lot of the preparation. You tell us where you would like the project so it's most useful for your grid is another thing, rather than, you know, in a, it's a different story in South Africa where you can let bidders pick their own sites. What we were finding was that a lot of those 12 cent tariffs were because landowners who happened to be fortunate enough to have a site right next to a substation were charging a premium. We worked on the basis that that should not be passed through to the tariff. So we let the government provide the land uh, and we um, asked them to demonstrate that they had title and we did all of those things. But fundamentally, the government had to do that. There was a fee payable, um, some discussion about whether or not we just sort of underwrote the whole cost of project development. No, no, our clients pay us fees for that service. And then there is a difficult conversation about, OK, here's the model. These risks are going to remain with you and these risks you can pass on to the private sector. You can tweak that, but the more you tweak it, the less bankable it will probably become. And then the longer you will take negotiating and putting sticking plasters on to try and get the project to financial close. That's quite hard for a lot of people to do. A lot of people are uh, a lot of governments have resource constraints. Uh, there's an election coming, there's political pressure, um, and there's a lot of competing offers and promises being made. We never promised ever uh, gigawatts and megawatts. We leave that sort of thing to others. What we promised was that there is something there that in theory could work anywhere with a fair wind and a government that was willing to pick up the hammer and start hamming, hammering in nails. Um, I think on the you, you asked a question and a follow-up question about the risk mitigation tools. What Can you just remind me what that was, please? I mean, primarily, what role do you see the, the risk mitigation tools um, playing in achieving the scale? And, and possibly also kind of the, the inverse of that is what um, potentially deterring role do, do they play in, in getting governments to sign up to a program like this, where, where some of the tools might end up uh, representing, for example, a, a contingent liability um, or other kind of um, risks on, on the government? Okay, so I think it's probably worth saying that unless and until we have fully liberalized sectors, the fundamental obligation to pay is going to rest with the government. If the government decides to use its scarce development dollars to buy a solar farm outright, it's paying on day one. It's not a contingent liability, it's an actual liability. If they decide to do more of the sort of higher purchase uh, model, the sort of PPP, IPP sort of thing where you pay over a period of time, as we all know, when you uh, involve lenders, you end up paying more in absolute terms, but it's more manageable and you can pay out of operating cash flows and revenues. Right. But the, the payment liability is on the public sector either way. So the, the idea that somehow because it's a contingent liability, that's a bad thing. It's already there. Right. So it, it, I, that one. What I think the focus needs to be on, and I mentioned this through the transparent competitive procurement, is by running the tender process and getting the tariff, the wholesale tariff down below the retail tariff, 
you make it easier for governments to avoid that contingent liability ever materializing. You can see if they're selling at seven cents and they'd signed one of those agreements at 12 cents, we all know what would have happened. They'd be in even worse straits than they are now. That's exactly what happened with that uh, power barge contract that they signed in order to cover the drought period that they had in Zambia. Right? We all know why they did it, because electricity is just, you can't manage without it. But look at what it's done to the finances. So the RMT instruments, which, as I mentioned, were available specifically because the program was so well designed. Right? They're not exclusive to the program. We saw them in the Azura project in Nigeria as well, which also has a partial risk guarantee. And there's MEGA insurance is you know, very often available if you want to go and approach MEGA. What we did was we addressed the point that I think Daniel made, which is that the, or maybe it was Miguel, the, the, the perception that it's so difficult to access these products. So we reversed the order. We stapled them to this product. And we said, if the government follows this line, these products are available on these terms. And that was made available to all the bidders in the data room. They all knew what the terms of that were. Now, it's never that simple. Of course, you still have to negotiate agreements. But it was a lot better than I've got my price. Now I'm going to look around and get, get the offer. Because if the price, if the wholesale price that is agreed is higher than the retail price these days, the chances of getting concessional lenders to help you achieve your own economics when you haven't even been through a competitive process are that much more remote. So it all fits together. Did I answer you? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a, a quick uh, question for um, Judy, and then I'm going to go to the questions from the chat. Um, Judy, I mean, this question on, on government's role is, is of course central in, in Zambia right now. And one of the, the key issues I think that's that's been front of mind for everyone involved in the Get Fit program is uh, the Zambian debt situation. Um, and I was wondering whether you could reflect on what your view is on the current debt restructuring that was recently announced and how that might impact um, your program. Uh, thanks for that uh, question, because perhaps in answering it, let me just take a quick step back. So um, I highlighted on my slides that our projects essentially came to a, a standstill, that it was in 2020. So shortly after COVID, uh, major impacts on the macroeconomic situation in Zambia, eventually leading to the government defaulting on it. One of the things that that had obviously done was um, triggered a rating downgrade. So currently, and that is probably one of the key hurdles that we had experienced in our program, is the fact that um, government rating is at a level that doesn't allow for certain of the um, DFIs. I think we might have lost Judy there for. Yeah, unfortunately. OK. Judy, we will get back to you, I hope, um, once connectivity is stored. But maybe let's go to one of the questions that we've got in the chat, which was specifically posed to Dan. Um, it's, it regards the relationship between the lenders and uh, the SPV or the project sponsors. And what happens when there are disputes between the lenders and the, and the uh, sponsors of the SPV um, after a close has been reached. How do you deal with that efficiently and quickly um, without putting the viability of a, of a project at risk? So I guess the it's slightly generic question, it's going to depend largely on, on the nature of the dispute. Uh, if we have a particular reporting requirement, so we want to see quarterly financial statements or pro forma balance sheets or whatever it is, and they're not being provided, we have a conversation with our client. It's a private conversation. It doesn't need to go any further. We have clients and client relationship managers and portfolio managers, and we speak. That's what lenders do when there are problems arising, contractual differences um, in a financing. Nothing new there or strange. Uh, I think probably the question might have been aimed more at issues where there is a dispute between some of the external parties and the project company, the SPV, that we have financed. And then we have to take a, a holistic view. The thing about those contracts, and I speak as a, as, a, as a lawyer, and this is why I'm not a lawyer anymore, is because they only take you so far. 
Um, it can say what it likes, but ultimately, if you built a plant, you're not going to take it away. Very few of them are actually have any sort of resale value at all. You're not going to take it away. It's all about making sure that you have the tools at your disposal to try and encourage the government to pay. You know, one is if you stop paying, you won't get any more investment. It's pretty obvious, uh, but you might do in a few years' time. But you know, fundamentally, why don't you carry on paying? Because you want people to come and bring resources and investment and expertise and partnerships to your country. But that's one of the advantages of being a DFI. And I, I, I hear everybody that it's great when the commercial market can just take this up on their own as they do in South Africa. We didn't finance a single solar PV or wind project in South Africa in any of the rounds because we weren't needed. The local banks did that role, right? They weren't available pretty much anywhere else where we've looked with, with scaling solar. And one of the things that bidders at least like about us and, and other DFIs being in the room is that when there is a, an issue, we can try and address this sensibly through a conversation with the government, through convening power, through our annual meetings when we meet with these governments and we have conversations. So, it, you know, we you will probably find us and anyone who has any experience of this, the nuclear option of legal enforcement is really just that. It really is a last resort. Nobody likes it and it's not good for development. Thanks, Dan. Um, I see Julie is back. So, Julie, do you want to quickly take a moment to, to finish your thoughts at where, yeah, uh, before sure. we lost you? Uh, okay, sure. So just coming back to the debt restructuring, personally, I, I think it's, it's quite significant. One of the things that was highlighted by Miguel on the slide um, is really the lack of um, DFIs really stepping in, right? When, when I would almost say when they most need it. Um, and so if you look at the situation in, in Zambia, granted that some of the DFIs had to step out uh, after the debt default, but the government have subsequently done so much. Um, I mean, one of the requirements was signing of the IMF debt relief package. They signed the staff level agreement in record time. They signed the IMF um, debt restructuring deal one, uh, sorry, the IMF debt relief package uh, one year later. Uh, granted that the debt uh, restructuring had taken longer than, than planned. I mean, the president had indicated that they'd hoped it would be done in a couple of months. Everybody had hoped that. It had taken longer. And what we had always tried to convince some of the DFIs is everybody knows that it will be done. So why not have faith and start a, a process maybe of due diligence and start working towards project implementation, why wait until the debt restructuring is actually concluded? Um, I think a lot of the DFIs have unfortunately taken this, this approach. I certainly think that the deal that was concluded uh, is good. Um, bits and pieces are coming out in terms of what exactly is being concluded. But one of the requirements from the lenders, um, at least, has been the signing of, of the MOU. I think what's being concluded paves the way for the signing of the MOU, but unfortunately, I think the MOU uh, signing still needs to needs to take place. Uh, maybe one thing that I want to mention is that we have fortunately managed to find a lender. Uh, I'm not sure if I can mention them, but DFC from the US um, that is now willing to consider um, financing the the, the Gitford projects within the current environment. Um, one other thing I quickly need to mention is we are trying to also look at more sustainable uh, uh, risk mitigation mechanisms, uh, specifically looking at the, the utility. So it's not only a question of adding uh, one um, type of guarantee or liquidity facility uh, after the next, but actually working together with the utility to say, what is it that they can put in place in order to give lenders comfort going forward? Uh, and so that's now a new ongoing initiative that, um, that, that we're working towards um, and hopefully we can conclude something shortly. Thank you, Judy. Just a quick follow-up question on, on the debt restructuring. One of the conditions initially from the IMF was that the government of Zambia was not able to provide sovereign guarantees. Um, and as Dan explained, in, in a context where you have state-owned utilities um, that are often not able to charge cost-effective tariff, that, that effectively means that the uptake risk of these projects sits with the government um, and that that needs to somehow be 
contractually guaranteed. Is is that still the case in in the kind of restructuring um, context? Because that is also one of the main um, recommendations from the report that that these kinds of carve outs for renewables projects and climate investments are needed in, in these debt deals? Yes, so I think that's that's a very good question and probably a critical question. Um, I mean, I think it's, um, I think either Daniel or Miguel showed it on their presentations. <laughs> it, it's simply not possible to conclude any private sector IPP uh, at this stage, uh, given the rating of most countries, most utilities, uh, without um, termination guarantees. So I think maybe that's just the first point. I think the second point is, if we look at the IMF framework, it, it essentially puts a debt ceiling on, so basically they did a DSA, debt sustainability analysis, and they've come up with a maximum level, which they call the debt ceiling that the government can borrow. So this is the challenge. They've kept the amount of money that the that the government's able to borrow. And then in addition, what they said, that cap includes guarantees. So the only way, so number one, government is limited in the amount of money it can borrow. It has other social projects, other infrastructure projects that it needs to consider. And arguably, financing needs to go towards those projects and programs. So you're left with the private sector to help with implementation. So if you put the same conditions, or if you say that private sector falls within that ceiling, you can see that it's, it's, it's simply impossible for government to implement IPP projects, which are critically required in order to drive economic growth, because that's what you need for the mining sector, agricultural sector, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things in our discussions with um, the IMF and, and, and also this lender that we've been speaking to, is we wonder, and I think it's the same thing that Dan has raised, whether or not IMF really understands the type of guarantees that are sitting under the IPPs. So um, I think I had the same conversation with Daniel. It's not, it's not payment guarantees, it's termination guarantees. So essentially all the government is doing is standing behind a contract Right, and this contract that they're standing behind is a contract where their utility has agreed to buy certain services or to buy a product, a product that they can resell, resell at times at a profit that would help them to repay IPP payments. Um, and so certainly the nature of it is fundamentally different. It's fundamentally different, I would say, to a normal uh, uh, guarantee for debt, because guarantees for debt, payment guarantees. These guarantees that we're ha having under the IPP framework is not similar. It's um, one of our partners under the program is Trinity and Paul will tell you, it's basically a doomsday scenario. It's in the event, everything goes wrong, Zesco or the utility continues non-payment, what would happen under that circum under those circumstances? You would put a plant to the government, and all they're doing is they guarantee to buy the plant for that value. So yes, they've got a liability, but they've also got an asset, and that asset can generate income for them. So, so one of the discussions that we also need to have in order to conclude um, on the on the get fit projects is probably to have this discussion with the World Bank and the IMF to ensure alignment on our understanding of the nature of these guarantees, number one. Uh, number two, to understand that projects just simply cannot be implemented without them. Uh, and thirdly, as, as one of the financiers said very nicely, IMF needs to understand that what it's buying is growth because without implementing IPPs, you just simply won't have um, electricity so economic growth would just continue to slow. Hope I answered the question. No, thank you, Jude. That is helpful. I think the, the reference to the doomsday scenario reminds me of a um, data set that we use when we teach on uh, project finance here at the university. And one of, the, one of the, the data sets that we use looks at default rates on project finance deals uh, globally. 
um, and specifically in the power sector. And what is interesting is that uh, power deals in sub-Saharan Africa uh, have the lowest default rate uh, globally. I think with the possible exception of the Middle East being slightly lower, but the US, Europe, et cetera, um, see much higher rates of default. And so there are obvious questions around risk perception versus reality, possibly also the fact that many of these projects that we are uh, developing are kind of gold plated often in terms of how much risk mitigation is, is um, uh, you know, part of the package um, and whether that might be too much or, or, or not enough. Um, but I have a question from Justine um, that I wanted to pose to the entire panel and I, I'm going to adjust it slightly, but the question is largely around whether there are cases of public-private partnerships that that specifically address um, risk mitigation, what their results are. And um, I want to extend this by, by also bringing in the issue of Chinese finance. We see China funding um, an incredible amount of power infrastructure across the continent, often with very different kinds of funding terms and risk mitigation measures than we find in the IPP space. And um, if, if you could comment on how um, that might be different to what we're seeing and what the kind of benefits and um, you know, possible drawbacks of, of both these approaches are um, to any of the panelists that are happy to speak to this, I'm gonna open the floor to you. Who wants to go first? Dan. Yeah, um, happy to. I, I mean, one piece that's missing, um, often overlooked, um, it was the case in Zambia and it was the case in Senegal, was that the classic approach to PPPs where it's either your project as a, on the public side or it's my project on the private side, isn't always the way to go and it's not always what our government clients are looking for. So in both of those countries, there is a government ownership stake in the project, which was paid for. So no free carry that drives up the tariff. They paid for it because they wanted to be on the inside. They wanted to actually understand how to integrate variable renewable energy with their hydro, uh, largely hydro dominated grid. Um, and the idea was recognizing the importance of local participation in some of these structures, but the challenge of doing that when everybody's doing it for the first time in the end, the best model we came up with was that the government decided that for every one of the scaling solar projects, and there were intended to be more until the sector hit, hit the buffers, um, the government would have this stake, it would be housed in a single vehicle, and then ultimately it might be floated uh, on a stock exchange uh, for anyone who wanted to participate in these projects to participate. And that was seen as the most democratic way of sharing the benefit amongst the local population as a whole. Um, that may still be a work in progress. I'm no, I'm no longer working with the government on that project. But that to me is another risk mitigant, is that if you spend time, rather than just handing over a suite of documents saying, my lenders want this, otherwise there's no project. If you spend time working with the public sector side, trying to find a model that works before you even go to market, and then everybody understands what deal they're doing and the government is involved both as an owner and as a customer, they can see the relative trade-offs between a more balanced or a less balanced contract. They understand both sides of the, of the equation. This must be more sustainable and therefore the risk must have been mitigated. That is very much a PPP model that we believe strongly and certainly I personally believe strongly and I'm doing it in hydros as well. Involve the government on the ownership side of the table and make sure that everybody understands the deal they're doing because they're far less likely to try and unwind it if there is good institutional memory about how they got there in the first place. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to come May... in now. We really have okay, three minutes sure. left, so I just want to acknowledge the time. Uh, this is, I hate interrupting and I mean, a great discussion. Penny, I don't know if you have a super short question in two sentences or less. Uh, if not, I'm going to give the so do you can you do that, Penny? Yeah, very quickly. Dan, hi, it's Penny. You know, my hey, probably know most of my my concerns, but just briefly, I mean, I hear you on 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 the listings, but I can't help because of the scars I have on Umemi in Uganda, raise the issue of what the terms of the exit are and how favorably skewed 
the terms of some of those concessions and executive structures are for those initial initial investors. I, I, I think the Umemi example in Uganda is a disgrace. And, and, and that was done via you know, some of your own, um, your own um, entity's um, contribution. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I think let me leave it there. I think there, there's, there is merit, absolutely merit in, 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 in ownership, got no doubt. But the how, the why, the process is a very different discussion. I'm afraid we aren't being honest. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid we're not going to have time to address this properly. No, I'm going to answer it, give... Miguel, if I may. Sure, but before that, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds each to you, to Judith, uh, to Wickers and Kruger, and to Daniel. If you want to have a last remark, and you may address this here, and then I'm going to bring the meeting to a close to respect everyone's times. Thank you, Daniel, for okay. yours. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's diff I won't go into detail because I can't. It's, uh, I'm not entirely sure what Penny's point was, but uh, I'm... You know, I was involved in that project tangentially before I joined IFC when I was with Global Act and the Actors family. Um, and then with IFC, I'm guessing when she said some of my sister entities, she must have meant that. Just to clarify to everybody, everything I've said on this call, I'm being quite honest, really very honest indeed. So uh, just to be clear, I, I refute the suggestion that I'm not being honest. Julie. Just a few closing remarks from my side. So firstly, thank you very much uh, for hosting this. Um, uh, key thoughts on my side is, uh, yes, risk mitigation tools, um, guarantees, et cetera, are, are important. But I think if one looks at long-term trajectory um, in, in Africa, the need for projects, uh, the amount of cost that these things do add uh, to the projects, uh, because they none of them uh, come at no cost. Um, one ultimately has to find a sustainable solution. I think um, we're hoping to try and see if we can achieve something under GetFit. But I think what I am trying to say is cannot continue with uh, guarantee and risk mitigation structures into perpetuity. At some point, uh, one needs to focus on working with the utilities in order to come up with uh, structures that are more sustainable and arguably uh, more affordable. So that's just that on my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Wickers, any last remark? No, I just want to agree with Judy. I think, um, again, to remind us as why we are facing the situation where we need these guarantees is that we are um, in most cases, um, asking the private sector to sell to uh, government-owned entities that are not solvent, um, even though commercially they should be and they have um, the ability to be. And so um, better governance, better structuring of the sector, I think, will go a long way towards unlocking investment. And we see that happening in the case of Namibia. Um, and I think that's that's something that we we do need to take into account when we think about guarantees. As as Judy said, it's it's not a um, it's not a sustainable, scalable solution for uh, yeah for the long term. Thank you. So on behalf of Daniel and myself and SCI, I want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, my personal takeaway is the hammer. A metaphor. So this is a tool it needs to be used so we can get 3000 nails in a day with a hammer. Maybe if we turn into a nail gun, we can do it in one hour and spend the rest of the day doing something else. So I thank you everyone for participating here. Please download the report. Uh, please visit our website on behalf of SEI and the Finance for Social Development. Thank you very much. And I know bring the meeting to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah.